All right, good morning. Hey, we've been working on this series talking about I want to believe, but, and if you're a part of small groups, you know that there is a parallel series that is called A Skeptic's Guide to Faith Conversations. So the conversations we're talking about are there not only for someone, if, if you were here and you say, you know, I'm, I don't know that I'm a believer, I'm not sure I understand who Jesus is, or believe, you know, the claims made about him, that would be great. This is a perfect uh, series for you. But if you're a believer and you're in a small group, you also understand that those conversations, as they continue, strengthen our faith and strengthen our belief and how necessary those conversations uh, really are. We've got a couple weeks left. And uh, if you've already looked in your outline, you've panicked. No, I'm just kidding, because there's a lot of stuff in there. But uh, the title is called uh, The Last great sign. Now, I want, let, me, let me help you with, with this uh, title because John, in the 11th chapter of John, John gives the last great sign of who Jesus is. And a sign would be some sort of um, miracle, something he does, something that points to Jesus as the Son of God, not just a man, you know, walking around and points to uh, who he is. But John also points out in his version of the gospel as he writes this, that Jesus had an ambivalence toward signs and miracles. Let me say that again. Jesus himself had a type of ambivalence toward signs and miracles. That may sound strange to you. Uh, it did to me because I didn't know what the word meant. But then I looked the word up. No, I knew what ambivalence. If you don't know what ambivalence means, ambivalence means that you have an attraction to something, uh, but at the same time, you, there's a repulsion to it at the same time, which may sound strange. You're like, well, how could you be attracted to something and repulsed by it at the same time? So let me go in and explain to you. Marriage. Okay, so you, you do get it. Okay, I just want to make sure. Right, so, so my wife has this attraction to me, you know, that, that she will admit that she has, but at the same time, sometimes there's a repulsion, you know, toward me that she has to put up. I see several people going, oh, yep, I know, exactly. You might say the same thing, for instance, maybe, maybe you had an ambivalence toward your, your father or ambivalence toward your mother. You, you were attracted to them, you wanted their approval, you wanted this relationship, and at the same time there was something about that that made the, the pull of it or the appeal of it uh, repulse you at the same time. I know you're gonna say, well, okay, we'll explain that with Jesus. Okay, here's, here's why I say that Jesus had an ambivalence toward signs or miracles. The, the reason is because they were there to show who Jesus was so that you would see the sign or the miracle and you would say, oh, you know, this is not a normal guy. This guy is different than every other person that, uh, that I've met before or seen before. And you see this all through all four of the gospels, this talk about it. We've never seen anyone do the things like this before. He speaks the way no one has ever spoken before. But at the same time, Jesus had a sense of repulsion to those things because people tend to get caught up in the miracles. <laughs> in the signs, and they think, that's it, that's what I want. And, and Jesus often said, a, a wicked and a, adulterous generation just wants another sign, you know? Th this is part of what he is saying. At, at, at one point, because of his miracles and signs, they decided to make him uh, king, they wanted him to be a uh, ruler, this is, this is what John records, and Jesus says no. And the reason is because he doesn't need them to make him king or ruler. It's, it's not the, the sign or the miracle, it's what the sign or the miracle points to as far as who Jesus himself is. This is why there are places where it says uh, Jesus left and would do no more miracles there. Or Jesus at one point said, hey, you know, to his, even to his uh, disciples, he said, you guys are all fired up because this is after the feeding of the 5,000. He says, because your bellies are full. <laughs> but not because you really catch it, you, you've not really understood it. And let's, let's be honest, many times it takes a lot of time for us to catch it or to understand what all this points to and what all this means as far as who Jesus himself is. <clears throat> in the chapter right before this, the one we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at chapter um, number 11, but in the chapter right before this, uh, this is where Jesus gets uh, kicked out of a city or he, or he leaves the city because it's dangerous. And, and this is not in your outline, but I just want to read a couple of verses um, for you, if I can find them again. 
Why did I turn the page? There it is. Okay, so this is in John chapter number 10. And this is what he says. It goes along with what we're talking about. He says this. He says to the, to the Pharisees, he says, look, if I do not do the works of my father, so he's talking about the signs and the things that he does. He says, don't believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, the things that I do is what he's saying. So that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So Jesus was saying that these things were all pointers to who he was. And, and if, if you look at what he, what he did and, and what he does, you would say, ooh, he's not like us. Um, he, 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 he needs to be dealt with or treated or followed as someone who is very different than us, Ab absolutely. But they tended to do the opposite. They tended to deal with him the way they would deal with each other, and he was a threat their, to their ability and uh, to their power. So Jesus uh, actually leaves this town that we're going to look at called Bethany. And I want to show you just a couple of maps. There, there are a couple in your, in your outline. I like maps. I like the way um, it helps us to visualize what's going on. And this first map is um, the area around Jerusalem. You see Jerusalem on the left. And uh, right next to it, you see this little town called, can you read that? It's what? Bethany, right, that's Bethany. And so Jesus is in Bethany in the chapter before. He leaves there because there's, they want to seize him. And so he leaves Bethany. He escapes their, their, uh, their grasp, and he goes east, and he goes to, to the uh, Jordan River, and he crosses over the Jordan River. It's probably about 15 miles, maybe 20 miles. And he's there, and there's a ford up there. It, 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 that is the place that, where it is believed that uh, John the Baptist would baptize people. And it says he, go, he goes there on the other side of the Jordan River. It's in the, uh, the area of Perea. And there actually is a town there also uh, called Bethany. But the Bethany he was in before is the one right next to uh, Jerusalem. So I just want you to see where he goes. As chapter 11 begins, this is where they are on the other side of the Jordan. And then he's going to go back to Bethany, and that's, that's going to be trouble. But here's also a little closer view. Um, this, is the, this is Jerusalem itself. I, I love this because this will help you to visualize uh, when you read stories uh, and, and, it, and it speaks of Jesus seeing things or pointing to things. It helps you to kind of see this. And you can see Jerusalem there. Uh, you see the temple where Solomon's, or actually this is Herod's temple, uh, is constructed and is, and is built. And, and it was built on what is called the Temple Mount. So that would mean naturally that it's a higher piece of ground, right? A small hill or a, or a small mountain, something like that. Next to it uh, is a valley. Do you see that? And that valley means there's a low area right after that. And uh, that valley uh, was a place where sometimes water would collect during the rainy season. Uh, but next to it, you see the Mount of Olives. Anybody see the Mount of Olives? So the Mount of Olives uh, is there and another mount. So you can see when Jesus would preach or or speak on the Mount of Olives, and he would look toward Jerusalem, that he could see Jerusalem, and many times he could actually see uh, the temple uh, itself and would use it as an example with them. And then right next to the Mount of Olives, on the east side of the Mount of Olives, is the town of Bethany. It's distance-wise, it's about two miles from Jerusalem. So it's not, it's not very far uh, and would not be very hard to get to. So I just wanted to throw that out. In fact, if you you know, if you say, boy, I would love to see that. We're going in April. Isn't that a cheap way to throw out an advertisement or something like that? So, no, <laughs> I think there are a few more spots still there. We're going to go, and I think it, it is always enlightening to see what it looks like and to kind of put the stories into some sort of context, and we would love to have you go if, you're, if you were uh, able to do that uh, in the end of uh, April. So here's the story. This is uh, in John chapter number 11. It says this. I'm going to read pretty fast because... There's a lot in the outline. Here's what it says. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary. So John is going to let you know, uh, identify, because there are a lot of Marys um, in the Bible. And so he's going to let you know which one this is. And in the next chapter, in chapter 12, he actually gives this story. But John is putting this, this in so you will connect it. He says, this is the Mary that later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, catch this, your dear friend is very sick. So you see the closeness that Jesus had 
to uh, Mary, uh, Martha, and to Lazarus. He's very close uh, to this family and, um, and loved them dearly. And it says in verse 4, but when Jesus heard about this, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Again, signs are what? They are a, a pointer to who he is. They let you know and you can see that Jesus is, is not like us, that he's something uh, very different and very uh, special. Verse number five says, so although Jesus loved Mary and um, Martha and Mary and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. So this, this would have had to be a, a, a strange thing for his disciples trying to figure this out. Okay, so your dear friend Lazarus is sick, but for two days we stay where we are on the other side of the Jordan River, we don't go. They probably assumed, you're gonna see from the narrative, that uh, it was because it was dangerous to go back to Bethany uh, for Jesus. So even though he loved him, uh, it would have been a dangerous thing to do. And then uh, from his conversation, they assume, okay, so um, he, is, he is sick, but he is not gonna, he's not gonna die. So they, they trusted him in this. And so it says in verse number eight, but his disciples objected, Rabbi, uh, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you gonna go back there again? Didn't it make sense to them? Verse nine, Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of the world. Um, but at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. So Jesus is referring to him being with them. And then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and I will wake him. Verse 12 says, the disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better, right? So if you know someone who's, who's sick and they're ill and they've, they're sleeping, they're resting, you know, they're just saying, okay, well, he's, he's going to get better. This is, this is a good thing. Um, but it says in verse 13, they thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, catch this, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. Now, why would he say that? Except, is this going to be another sign to who Jesus himself is? So will be for their benefit. Uh, for now, uh, you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, remember Thomas? Um, this is a guy that, that we will, uh, most of us know as uh, Doubting Thomas, but his uh, nickname was uh, Didymus, which meant uh, twin. So Thomas, nickname twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go to and die with Jesus. Now I have to admit, I like those lines. I've always liked those lines. Something about Thomas now, in my mind, Thomas is not Doubting Thomas. Thomas is Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, yeah because that's what it sounds like to me. Jesus is, we're gonna go back there anyway. Don't you know how dangerous this is? They were seeking your life there. I, I understand, but we're going back there. So Eeyore, Thomas goes, okay, let's go with him and die with him. You know, it's kind of like that, like the eternal pessimist. It's not gonna work out. It's gonna be a bad thing, but we might as well go back and die with him. You know, here we go. And so that, that's, that's, just, that's just in my mind, too much Winnie the Pooh growing up, I guess. Um, but uh, the, it, it's an important thing because you know what it says about the disciples? Um, they were with him. So if it meant going back and we perish and we die, then they had already made that decision that this is what we're gonna do. Now you have to remember, they've been, they've been with Jesus for three years. Uh, at this point, even though, you know, in John's gospel, he covers, you know, the time really quickly. This is, this is three years into Jesus uh, choosing them, calling them to follow him, them watching him. They see so many signs and things that he has done. Um, only a fraction, excuse me, only a fraction were recorded uh, by John in his uh, version of the gospel, but, but they were fully in with, with Jesus. Um, they didn't understand everything. They didn't know everything, but they had decided they knew enough that if he goes back to Bethany to perish, to die, then we go with him. And then this is where it jumps to the story. On the back of your outline, you'll see this. If you want to make a few notes, hopefully there's a little bit of room left. Here we go. This is what it says in verse 17. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. 
So apparently whenever they sent the messenger uh, to Jesus, which was about two days for Jesus to go back to Bethany, then he must have died right after the messenger um, left to come uh, tell him. Verse 18, Bethany was only a few miles down the road from uh, Jerusalem. So Bethany was about two miles from Jerusalem. And many of the people had come to console Mary and Martha, or Martha and Mary, in their loss. So it makes sense that they could come from Jerusalem, just go to uh, Bethany to uh, console them. Uh, But Mary, I'm sorry, it says in verse 20, um, when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. So two different reactions. Uh, Luke tells us a lot more about the personalities of Mary and Martha. But Martha is the doer. Uh, She's the one that is is, uh, much more uh, action-driven, getting everything done. Uh, Mary is the more contemplative one. And it actually, uh, we we know that Mary actually sat at Jesus' feet and learned, which for a Jewish rabbi would have been incredibly unusual uh, because they did not have women sit at their feet and learn. But Mary was one of those who did. Jesus did things uh, very differently than uh, the other rabbis uh, that were around. And so she was very close to Jesus um, and very much someone who wanted to understand and wanted to learn as he uh, taught. So it says in verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, think about it. Wouldn't you say something like this? Lord, if only you had been there, my brother would not have died. Lord, if only you had been there, my brother would not have died. Now, I know that some people think that this is Mary chastising Jesus. Um, I think that this is Mary, her belief in Jesus, her understanding of who he was, watching him. She realized if he had been there, he would have healed Lazarus and Lazarus would not have uh, died. Would not. I don't think she's chastising them. And one of the reasons I say that is because I think that in their culture um, and in their time, it's very different than our time. We tend to look around and say, hey, you could have fixed this. Why didn't you? And we tend to assign guilt to anyone that we think could have fixed even something in our world or in our affairs. It was your responsibility to fix this. And, and say, are you saying something about our culture? Yes, of course I am. Uh, <laughs> because we, we tend to think we someone owes us or we deserve. It's just sort of where the Western culture has gone. That was not their culture. They, they would not have looked at it that way. They wouldn't looked at it as somehow God owes me or Jesus, you owe me or you were supposed to do something. Uh, Mary would have looked at it as this, as this privilege of being around him, but she is, she is recognizing and saying clearly, if you had been here, and, and you weren't, but if, if you had been here, uh, he would not have passed away. In fact, if you look at, look at how Mary goes on after that, the very next um, verse, verse 22, But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Again, I do not think this is Mary saying, but you're going to make Lazarus rise. I I think she is acknowledging who Jesus is, and she's saying something about him. But even in the next part of the conversation, you see that Mary has no anticipation, I mean, Martha has no anticipation of what Jesus is going to do, but instead continues to express an incredible trust in Jesus and in who he is. Look at the next uh, paragraph, verse 23. Uh, Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Actually, in the Greek, I know it may not make a lot of difference um, but, um, because the meaning is the same, but in the Greek it actually says, your brother will rise. It doesn't use the word again. It just means, of course, you know, they translated it this way. But he just says, he's going to rise. And in, verse, in the next verse, 24, yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus, verse 25, told her, I am the resurrection and the life. One of Jesus' great I am statements. She's she's talking about something that's going to happen to her brother, and and Jesus is speaking to her as he does to us to who affects this, who causes this to happen. Jesus himself is the one. So it's not just a thing that's going to happen. It's tied to who Jesus himself is is. And and he's teaching her even more about who he is. Again, the idea of the signs versus what the signs point to and the one that the signs point to. And Jesus, once again, is uh, reminding her that I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. 
Do you believe this, Martha? And she says, yes, Lord. I've always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. So here are Martha's um, statements to him of her belief and her trust, and that she, as best she could, knew who he was and was holding on to who Jesus himself was. Uh, it's not a statement at all of any um, uh, expectations or you, you, you must do this or you have to do this for me. It is, a, it is their statements from Martha of, of this incredible trust that she has. As John would say, she believed uh, in Jesus. And then look at the next sentence, verse 28. It says, then she returned to Mary. This is Martha. Um, she called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus, who stayed outside the village at the place where Mary met him, uh, Jesus, he had stayed there. When the people who were in the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed that she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet. And she said, Lord, here we go again. If only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now with Mary, it's, it's probably a deeper thing with Mary. With Mary exclaiming again, this is painful. This is difficult. I'm really struggling with this loss and uh, probably much more emotional because you see her reaction. She falls at his feet. She is weeping and she is crying where, where Martha doesn't have quite as strong an, as an emotional reaction. And Jesus is obviously moved because of the relationship that he had with Mary who would sit at his feet and, and listen to his teachings. You know, one of the things that kind of jumps out to me, I've heard this uh, talked about before, is it's the same question but the response of Jesus and how he deals with Martha and how he deals with Mary are different in, in many ways because of, of who they are and because of his, his connection with, him, with them, even though the same statement is made, the same, the same um, if only is, is put out there as they are struggling with this. I think Mary is struggling much more emotionally with the fact that this loss could have been prevented. I don't think she's trying to guilt Jesus. I don't think she's trying to put anything on him, but she's expression are expressing even more her emotional pain and her emotional struggle. So let me, let me go ahead and, and just jump into this for a second. You think God understands the struggles you have? When, you, when you're in pain and it's difficult for you, do you think that God understands that God relates to what you're going through and what you're feeling. See, I think this is all intended, these conversations, so that we would realize, yes, of course he does. He knows what pain is all about. He knows what disappointment is all about. He knows what, what it feels like when, when all of a sudden this looks like a dead-end road. This is the end and, and that, that sense of uh, where do I go from here? It, it's, it's all over. There is no hope. I think Jesus understands uh, what that feels like. And I think that Jesus cares about that. And I think that he relates to those feelings. So if you find yourself in that situation, I think just like Martha and Mary, the best place to go is toward Jesus who understands. Not go toward Jesus and therefore he will fix it. The initial response of Jesus is, is to relate to who we are. For us to find our belief and our comfort in Jesus himself, knowing that he knows more than we know. Knowing that he, his plans are bigger and better than, than my plans, than, than, than what I have figured out. Jesus doesn't chastise her for this, no more than he chastised Martha for this. Instead, what Jesus does is Jesus relates to this uh, with Mary just in a different way than he uh, related with Martha. So here's what... Um, uh, he says, it says, um, when Jesus saw her weeping and he saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Did you catch that? A deep anger grew up inside of Jesus. And the words that are used here, uh, absolutely, uh, they they denote the idea that there was almost like a rage that was in Jesus that, that troubled him 
because of, and, and that's always the question, what is Jesus angry about? What is this rage about? I don't think it was about them. I don't think he was angry because he, he thought you don't believe enough or anything like that. I think that it was because of the effects of our separation from God, our own sin, the, the effects of, of, of death in this world, of discouragement in this world that has come from the enemy himself, from Satan himself. And there's this, there's this fight in Jesus that Jesus is angry about it. And he's not only wanting to comfort, but of course he wants to to deal with this. In fact, the word uh, shows a sort of a picture of Jesus as being stern. You know, he, he's going to cry also. It's going to say that he weeps, but there's this sternness, this fierceness, this going to face the enemy-ness uh, of who Jesus is uh, in this picture. So it says in the next verse 34 that Jesus asked him, where have you put him? They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. Because they, they see his reaction um, and, and they understand the compassion he had for Lazarus. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Here we go again, third time. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? It's, it, it's again, the natural question. Even from those who are outside of Mary and Martha, outside of this family that he loved, they asked the same thing. Couldn't, have this, couldn't this have been uh, prevented somehow? Couldn't he have fixed this? Now, I want you to think about this because this is really worth wrestling with because you will ask the same things. I will ask the same things in life. Couldn't God have fixed this? Couldn't Jesus have done something about this? And the fact that he didn't do anything about it, as, as he's going to point out in this story, means he has bigger and better plans than what we think we want or we think would fix this situation. I want you to think about that. Because this is built on a trust, a belief in him. That God is not there to do what I think needs to be done, even though it's natural for me to think that way. It's natural for me to ask those questions. I don't think Jesus was offended that the questions were being asked. But what Jesus is trying to do, he's trying to point us, point me and you toward the fact that, that if he allows something to happen, if we go through those things and it doesn't work out the way that we want it, even though we might spend a lot of time asking him to fix it, praying for God to step in, that God has other plans that are better than the plans that we have. And in this case with Lazarus, let me tell you, the power of the plan is enormous because Jesus is about to do something that if he doesn't do this, we don't really understand who he is. When Jesus causes Lazarus to rise again. In fact, um, many commentators have, uh, have accurately said, this is a turning point in Jesus' life. It's a turning point in his life. This is the last great sign. Because when Jesus steps over this line and decides to raise Lazarus from the dead, you know what happens? The Pharisees and the religious leaders and the powers to be then set in stone, that's it. We're going to kill him. We're going to take his life. It's, it's over with as far as that is concerned. They have decided this is the last draw. This is the last thing we're going to allow his power is increasing. We must do all that we can to eliminate him. In fact, if you look at the, uh, after uh, verse 44, or beginning of verse 45, we're not going to go through that this morning. But if you read the story, and I encourage you to go and read it uh, today because you will love this story. It's exactly what happened. They gather together. Caiaphas, the high priest, gathers them together. In fact, he calls all the other um, uh, people in the Sanhedrin, he calls them kind of knuckleheads. You don't get it, do you? You don't understand who this guy is. You don't understand, you know, what he's come to do. And he makes, he makes this statement, which John says, since he was the high priest, he's actually prophesying from God. He says, it is better for one to die than for the whole nation to suffer. Him, he meant the wrath of Rome uh, if this guy keeps rising up. And John says he's actually prophesying. He just doesn't understand what he's prophesying because it was better for one to suffer and one to give his life. He's just prophesying about what Jesus is about to do and what is about to come. But they have decided this is it, no more. 
And after this, John uh, makes it clear, this is it for Jesus as far as miracles are concerned, as far as signs are concerned. He gives no more after Lazarus himself is raised um, from the dead. So then here's what it says um, in verse 38. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. Don't you like this? A cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Sounds very similar to where Jesus himself was buried because this is the way they would do um, tombs in their day, carve them out of the rock. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. In, in the King James, it says, he stinketh. And in the King James, Jesus' reply is, indeedeth. He absolutely stinketh. No, okay, it doesn't say that, but uh, it should. That would be fitting. Yeah, he, of course, because four days in, in, in a, hot, a hot climate like, like they were, uh, this would be a really bad idea to roll the stone away. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, listen to this prayer. Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. Don't you know it's got to be dead silent? <laughs> and the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth, and Jesus told him, unwrap him and let him go. Final straw. <laughs> the religious leaders, the powerful people are not going to put up with any more. Do you realize what he just did? Do you realize the implications of this? In fact, let me, let me say it even this way. If, if you and I do realize it, if we, if we listen to the story and we catch where they were and, and how, what they saw, the, the truth of what Jesus just revealed about himself is absolutely life-changing. This is not an ordinary man. This, this is not a person who performs tricks. This is not a person who is trying to, to do miracles and all so that he could get something from you. This is a man who came to do something for you, to change your whole life as far as your understanding of who God is. Does God care? Does God listen in my struggles and in my pain, in my difficulties, in my hurts where I think this is the end? He is saying it's not the end. It's not the end. Why? Because I am the resurrection and the life. One of the things I'm always amazed by, can't explain it, but as I tell you, the next, told you, the next part goes on to tell um, the reaction of the religious leaders. But you know what it says? <clears throat> many of those who were there and who saw this, many of them believed, but others went to the Pharisees. It's, it draws a line there. It's kind of a strange line, isn't it? So there's a group that believes uh, Jesus and he says, nope, but, you know, this, this is too plain. This is too clear. If he can do this, that. And then there's another group who's standing there, sees exactly the same thing in one sense, asking exactly the same questions. And their response is very different. In fact, the way that, that John uh, words it or puts it, their response is not to believe, but instead to go to the religious leaders and say, do you know what he did this time? <laughs> do you understand the implications of this? Looking to them to deal with it, fix it, and they decide, we've got the fix. We're going to do away with him. We're going to put him to death. 
Don't you know that that same issue is what we struggle with? Even in our, in our pain, our struggles, our difficulties, things that don't go right, things we don't understand, God, why, why is this that, that it, it's always an issue of belief? Is he faithful? Is he trustworthy? Can he do what he said um, that he has done, even though I can't explain it, even though I don't understand it, even though that's not the way I wanted it to, to work out, can I look to him and believe that his way, what he wants, is better than, than my way? E even if there are those who will ridicule me for believing that, isn't it better to believe it and to follow him and to trust them uh, than to go a different way and try in a sense to go against the one who not only cause Lazarus to be raised from the dead, but he, he would only 10 days later rise from the grave himself and change the whole world. Would you pray with me this morning? I, I think one of the great things about this conversation, <clears throat> for me still, hopefully for you also, is it causes me to be challenged in how much do I believe? How much do I trust? And, and maybe where I, I struggle the most, I'm sure that you do too, um, in those areas of my life where I suffer, where I go through pain, and, and I don't know where to turn with that pain. I don't know what to do with it or, or how to somehow fix it. And sometimes, maybe you're like this, I've done this before, you even look to God and say, God, I don't understand why you won't fix this, why you won't make this into something that I would prefer it to be rather than leaving me here in this place. And then even in that struggle to come to the understanding that he has not left me, that he goes through this with me, walks me forward because he has better plans than mine. If you're here, you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, never trust him, never believe. That's John's word. Oh, what an invitation. What an opportunity, just like those who saw him and they made a choice. Some decided to go back to the Pharisees, to their old way of thinking, their old way of doing things. And some who decided that they had to believe. How could they go back to old ways after seeing what Jesus himself has done? If you've never invited Jesus Christ into your heart, you can say something like this, Lord Jesus, I believe you. I believe that you're who you say you are. That God sent you to this earth 2,000 years ago to live like us, <clears throat> and yet you didn't live like us. You lived a life that was sinless so that you could offer up yourself on our behalf to pay for our sins and so that we could be made alive again. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done. In his name we pray.